Now it's changed because we realized that, wow, it's it's not only ventilators, it's, you know, heart lung bypass, it's renal bypass, all these different, you know, therapies that we can give simultaneously. Dr. Michael Schweitzer, welcome to eShadowing. Thank you very much. Happy to be here. I really appreciate it, Dr. Gray. Yeah, I'm excited to chat with you. Uh, as students, as you're rolling in um, to watch, say hello, change your chat to everyone. Let us know where you are watching from. We're going to be talking home critical care, which are two subspecialties that kind of go hand in hand these days. Um, it, it'd be interesting to know. I don't know if you know the the history of critical care and when the the poem critical care kind of came into fashion. Uh, what I what I love is that this is actually a like a small segment of, of my of my talk. Actually, yeah, uh, very small. But um, but you know, back in the and and I'll just discuss it a little bit now. But back in the day, like a family medicine doctor, basically primary doctor would do everything from the yeah. get go. And so they would take their patient from the clinic. They'd be like, you are sick. You have a pneumonia. You need to go to the hospital. They would admit them. And mm -hmm. then they would even manage them in the ICU. Yeah. You know, this is 40, 50 years ago. And now as things, as there's been so many more advances in the medical science and so much more technicality to kind of managing these really complicated patients, the, uh, you know, the, the need for a specialty has arisen. And so it, it started as pulmonary um, slash pulmonary critical care. And I hate to say it, I don't know the exact year, but uh, <laughs> but when they, when they kind of started, it was like, okay, we need somebody who really understands lungs and how to manage lungs because the big, you know, device that we had was a, was a ventilator. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, having somebody who could specialize in, uh, in pulmonary also really afforded you a lot of advantages there. Now it's changed because we realized that, wow, it's, it's not only ventilators, it's, you know, heart lung bypass, it's renal bypass, all these different, you know, therapies that we can give simultaneously. So there's all these different specialties that are now involved, but, uh, but yeah, that's originally how, at, at least to my understanding, pulmonary got kind of wrangled into the whole ICU too, because <laughs> they're, they're quite, different in a lot of ways have, have you ever thought about the old like the good old days of medicine <laughs> where where you were that like doctor that did it all of like hey we're gonna go from my office i'm gonna i'm gonna drive you to the hospital and i'm gonna admit you and i'm gonna round on you every day after or before my my patients in the clinic you know hey, i would, would you want to practice in those days i I would love to say that I would. <laughs> That's what I would love to say. Yeah. Uh, and that I'd get paid in like, you know, a dozen eggs <laughs> or, you know, a cake or something like that. Uh, yeah. Absolutely. I would love to say that that that, that would have been the, the good old days. But I don't know, realistically, uh, <laughs> it's it's just so different. The way what I'm thinking about now is like is is the kind of the revolution that we're on as far as technology and how like obviously you with you know everything that you're doing, all the teaching that you're doing for these pre-medical students and medical students and and how technology impacts what can be kind of like the good new days. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like and, and I I want to I'll get a little bit more into it towards the end of my lecture uh talk. Yeah. But uh, but yeah I think it's it's fascinating the evolution and and how you know we're we're like this narrow you know time frame that of this giant field that's expanded and will continue to expand in the future. So it's it's just yeah. really exciting. Yeah, and, and as you mentioned, right the the those old days where someone could do it all, we're at a point now in our in our life. I think the data is every two to three months, our knowledge of medicine doubles. Like we are just exponentially learning more and more and more and more and more. And and I always laugh when when it's like med school is like, oh, we're we're going from a traditional 24 months of preclinical down to 18 months so that we can get you more <laughs> clinical time. I'm like, the, we're doubling every two to three months. How how am I supposed to anyway? Whatever. Let's get started with your talk. All right, cool. Cool. Uh let's see. Okay. All right, cool. So this is uh, this is my e-shadowing uh, presentation. My name is Michael Schweitzer. I am an osteopathic physician, a DO. Uh, I'm a pulmonary critical care 
staff physician, uh, and I am in the United States Army currently. I'm getting out in a few months, uh, but because of that, we always have to put this cutesy little disclaimer that says these are my uh, these are my you know thoughts and not the thoughts of the United States Army. Um, and I'm sure Dr. Gray, you got to do that a little bit when you did your presentations oh, yeah. <laughs> back in the Air Force. Um, so just a brief summary about what we're going to discuss today. I'll talk about myself and and uh, we'll try to get through everything. I, I love talking and I can expand upon any topic. So it, it, it's possible that we may not get through everything, uh, but we'll talk about my background in introduction to ICU and pulmonary, you know, some pros and cons about why you might want to do it as a specialty or why not. A um, couple, couple interesting cases, uh, what it's like to be a military physician, a little bit of pros and cons there as well. And uh, some just some tips for, for budding young doctors, a little bit about telemedicine and, and kind of like what my future plans hold and hopefully what some of your future plans hold. Okay. Um, so this is my shameless, shameless plug. So I have a medical Instagram page that is very much in its infancy. Um, and I'm, I'm working to uh, predominantly focus on, you know, mentorship of pre-medical slash pre-nursing slash nursing slash medical students. Um, and so I have a lot of, uh, a lot of information about mainly what it's like to be in the ICU, because that's what I know the most, um, but quite a bit of just like day-to-day -day knowledge about uh, quizzes. Like I have a quiz every day that's on my story and stuff like that. And um, and I'm, I'm still building and looking forward to you guys, please, please, please following me. Because like I said, it's in its infancy and it really needs like some jump starting. So thank you. Okay. So for how, me- How many times uh, do you hear faux shizzle, McSwizzle? <laughs> Not that's as many as I would like. I, I would hear. like to hear that like a hundred <laughs> times a day. <laughs> uh, Shows my age. <laughs> oh, mercy. That's awesome. <laughs> so, um, so I was born in Minnesota. Uh, my dad was in the Air Force. And uh, so we traveled around to Omaha, Nebraska, Dayton, Ohio, Columbus, Ohio. And then we settled in Columbus, Ohio. Uh, my dad was the first uh, person in his family, first pers person in my entire family to go to college. Uh, my grandfather was a truck driver excuse me. And, um, and I'm the first person in my family to become a physician. Um, and so, you know, it's been, it's been great being accepted into the medical field as kind of a, a, a new person in the, in the field. So it's got its benefits and definitely has its benefits if you have the legacy behind you as well, but it's, it's just kind of cool. And that's one of the things I'm definitely very proud of. I went to college in a tiny what, town. What did your dad so, do in the air force? Oh, he was an engineer. Um, nice. he, he did like, uh, Back in the the way old times, he actually helped to um uh gosh, what's that called? He helped to map um like missiles because at that time we were kind of like pointing missiles at Russia. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, probably like today. Um, but anyways, yeah. uh so he helped to do like like with a protractor and like a <laughs> you know calculator helped to yeah. direct those courses. He was a human with... computer. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So nice. I'm probably like the dumbest guy in my family. My brother's a biomedical <laughs> engineer uh, for Stryker. So like, uh, but anywho, um, yeah, I went to a small school in Steubenville, Ohio, uh, went to medical school, an excellent medical school in Lewisburg, West Virginia called West Virginia School of Osteopathic Medicine. Um, I did my internship and residency in El, uh, William Beaumont Army Medical Center in El Paso, Texas. And I did my fellowship at Walter Reed, um, which is like the, the Gucci hospital of the, of the military. Um, oh, that and, and BAMC also for the air force guys. Um, uh, and then I, uh, I currently practice, um, uh, in Washington state at a place called Madigan army medical center. Um, cool. So my, uh, my first time I made a diagnosis was actually at, uh, the, this just came up like two nights ago with my family. I was talking about cause they found my, his old records. But, uh, when I was six years old, I was playing basketball with my older brother um, who like suddenly got freaking huge. Uh, he, he like grew like three inches in like a month or something like that. And I, <laughs> when we were playing basketball, of course uh -oh. he's beating me. <laughs> and, uh, and I saw that he had, um, armpit hair and I was like, <laughs> like, what? That's so weird. Why does he have armpit hair? You know, like 
I, you know, I'm just a kid. I didn't know anything about yeah. that. So I told my mom and, yeah. uh, and then she talked to a, talked to a doctor on his like basketball team or whatever. He had, he had like an intramural basketball team that he was a part of. And uh, they said, well, let's just do some blood work and stuff. And ended up being that he had what's called a, an astrocytoma wow. um, that was pushing on his pituitary stock and it caused, mm-hmm. caused him to develop precocious puberty. So anyways, yeah. not to say that I'm like, knew what I was doing, anything like that. I was just like making fun of my brother, I think, but fortunately- You were observant. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's true. So at the uh, at the end of the day, like it, it helped him to, um, yeah, I guess it, it got him to get a surgery and and now he's doing, you know, he did great afterwards. And so it was really lucky. Uh, benign? Astrocytomas are benign or not? Yes, sir. Yeah, it was benign. Yeah. Thank goodness. Um, and it was, it was, it was kind of miraculous. It like, it shrank up before the surgery. It was all kinds of like weird, cool stuff that happened with it. That uh, yeah, I yeah, uh, I I I I'm definitely of a of a I we understand science very well, and I want to make everything as black and white as possible. But I also am a person who believes in in potential miracles happening to patients too, because I've seen a, a couple in my time. So yeah. Um, anyway, sorry. So my, uh, my, my training, um, I went directly, you know, whatever, kindergarten, first grade, all the way through fellowship, no breaks, no pauses, nothing. Wow. It was cool. Uh, but I would say I didn't take a gap year. I didn't do like, I, I didn't have a lot of, uh, um, like college credits coming into college. In fact, I had zero. So a lot of my colleagues went and like, were able to do a summer abroad and stuff like that in college. And, I, I didn't do any of that. Um, and yeah, so that, so I would definitely say just a quick, you know, aside here, um, this, if you want to become a doctor and you're going to become a doctor, like you have so much time to, to like take care of yourself and take care of those things, like taking a gap year, taking a few months off, take like, maybe even extending your college, whatever, like, so that you can do that semester abroad. It's, it's, it's potentially really worth it and and foundational. And, uh, and I think it took me a while to mature to the level of some of my colleagues because of that, uh, because I, I have just always essentially been in this, this student role. So, um, so just remember, you have your entire life, like to, there's no, like, this isn't a race. And I know it feels like a race. And like, if you don't, get in right away right now or, or whatever, like it might be the end of your, you know, you feel like it's the end of your world, but I promise you it's not, you have so many, like so many different opportunities. Anyway, sorry. Here's a quick, like brag, humble brag. Uh, so this is me and my buddy. We won the, uh, Jeopardy championship for the army air force ACP. And it just, it just so happened that it came to my institution like recently. So I was all excited. Anyways, uh, (laughs) So you want to be a doctor. I wanted to as well. Initially, I was like, loved kids, wanted to do pediatrics. That was going to be the greatest thing in the world. Uh, went on some clinical rotations, realized it wasn't that. And I was like, ah, orthopedic surgery, that's it for me. Like I can like, I can bench press like a decent amount. You know, <laughs> I think I can hang up the bros. And uh, then I found out that th- that wasn't really it for me. I'm like, okay, let's go totally different here. Psychiatry. Uh not, not so much, you know, I've thought about it. Like they're all so interesting. They're also fun. Um, but you just got to find what, what works for you. And I thought maybe family practice broad, get everything, babies, elderly, everything. Um, and then I was dead set. All right. I'm going to do general surgery 100% and ended up, uh, realizing on one rotation that that's <laughs> absolutely not it for me. It's like, okay, cool. Then emergency medicine and lo and behold, you know, match day came around and stuff or, you know, signing in for the match. I'm like, all right, I'm going to do internal medicine. Uh, that'll give me at least a couple more years to figure out what I want to do. What do you want to do when you grow up? Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yeah. And all, all of that was in the timeframe of med school. That was in uh, med school and, uh, yeah. Yeah. Medical school. Yeah. Yeah. You're bouncing around. Like, you're that typical student, like every rotation, this is what I want to do. And then you're like, next one, this is what I want to do. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> the only thing was OB, the, the, the baby catching, like oh. absolutely freaked me out. So it's, it's so funny. So I, I was mentioning before we hit record that, that I wanted to be an orthopod. 
OB was the one rotation that almost pulled me away from from applying ortho. I loved OB. I don't know why. It's just the the patient population and the the anatomy and pathology and and all of that fun stuff. It was it was amazing. I loved it. It's like a whole different OB is. I swear, it's like a different. It's almost. It's almost like, uh, like podiatry or something. Not like not exactly <laughs> the same way, but it's like it's almost a different like entire field of medicine. They have all different terms like yeah. Nokia, all these things. I still don't understand what that <laughs> P, P all that stuff means. Um, so I would just say, you know, at this point, maybe we'll just take a second to kind of reflect and think about why at this point you want to go into medicine and just kind of ruminate on that and and think yeah. about it over the next couple of days and just think like you know, what is it that I want to get out of this? And I went into medicine for the, all the typical reasons. I like science. Uh, I like want to help people, altruism, all that stuff. And, and at the end of the day, now that I've done medicine for years and years, I realized that the best and coolest part about medicine, aside from all those things, which you get to do is, is the interactions that you get with your colleagues and the interactions that you get with your patients. And the, the medicine, the science is, is cool and awesome, but the ability to, to connect with people on that deep level is just yeah. it's the bee's knees. I mean, it's, it's that's, awesome. That's what I tell students all the time. I, obviously, I'm not practicing anymore. My wife uh, still practices some. She's a neurologist. Um, the, 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 the business of healthcare is constantly changing, right? With, with insurance models and this and that. And hopefully we, my, my stance is we get to a, a universal um, uh, single payer system at some point that that's constantly changing and in flux and who's, who's your boss or whatever is, is going to change. When you close that door to be in the room with the patient, to me, that's the part of medicine that has never changed, right? Maybe your time limit in the room has changed, but <laughs> but that one-on-one -on -one connection, I think is just fantastic. And it's one of the biggest things I miss from practicing medicine. Yeah, it's true. It's like, it, that's that point that, that kind of connects you, as you were saying before, you know, to being like that old timey doctor who's, you know, dragging them or driving them up in your wagon to the, <laughs> to the hospital or whatever. And, and, you know, where we are now and where we're going in the future is that, that just like you said, when you close the door and it's just you and them. Um, yeah. So why do you do internal medicine or why would you consider internal medicine? There's a broad mix. You can do clinic, you can be a hospitalist, you can kind of do both. You, there's like so many options out there. You can focus on what you want to. You have to know everything, which is cool. Everything about medicine, patients 18 and above essentially. Um, but it gives you a lot of time to delve into like much more masterfully into the pathophysiology of their disease process and to become a master of that. Um, you know, the, the internal medicine, the good internal medicine doctor um, is the one that everyone should be going to for kind of like their answers, their primary answers. Um, and like I said, it's a, it's a gateway drug, right? So that's, this is the gateway to get into all these different, you know, fellowships, nephrology, pulmonary, critical care, um, cardiology, uh, endocrinology, all, all tons of different specialties that you can get into sleep medicine, whatever aerospace medicine. No, well, I actually, I don't know aerospace medicine, but anyways, um, it's widely marketable. And, and, uh, right now there's these weird shifts that happen in med like in healthcare, just like you were saying, as far as pay, but right now hospitalists at least are paid like exceptionally well. Um, so it's, it's not a bad one just to, to get into for that. Um, not that it should be about money. Uh, and then here we go. <laughs> Old timey doctors used to have their outpatient clinic. Uh, like, like I talked about uh, before with, you know, why are pulmonary and critical care linked? Uh, and this is basically kind of what I discussed before. So I'll, I'll go through this kind of quickly. Um, ICU, right? So the art of medicine consists of amusing the patient while nature cures their disease. Uh, and, and I think that's, that's such an apt quote, especially for the ICU. I spend so much time standing around, like wandering around, <laughs> pontificating to whoever will listen to me in the ICU. Um, well, honestly, the majority of my majority of what I do is make two or three very well thought out, but very and very direct changes to the patient's care that day, and then reassess what's going to happen the next day. So instead of constantly tinkering and trying to, you know, make everything 100% perfect, we found that, you know, uh, 
what is it? Better is the enemy of good. So a lot of times we get the patient to where they need to be 90% of the way and then let their body do the, you know, well, actually we probably do 10% of the body does 90%. Yeah. <laughs> I'll be honest. So what's an average day, uh, excuse me, what's an average like month for the ICU or pulmonary doctor? So um, if you're doing both, you'll do maybe one to two weeks of ICU per month, which is 12 hour shifts typically. Um, and then you'll do one to two weeks of pulmonary clinic per month, which is usually an eight to 10 hour day. Um, one to two weeks of inpatient pulmonary per month, which is usually a shorter day. Most, most of the time, there's not as many pulmonary consults. So sometimes that gets mixed in with clinic or ICU as well. Um, and then you off times will have one or two weeks off per month. You'll notice that this, if you add up all of them, it adds up to like eight weeks. So there's a ton of variability. And a lot of it depends on the group that you're in, the practice that you're in, you know, what you, what you personally want to do as far as the amount of like work. Um, and so there's a, a ton of flexibility there. Um, an average day in the ICU, you arrive at about seven, pre-round at 7.30. And this could be arrive at six, arrive at five, and then it ends at five, but usually it's about seven. Pre-round at 7.30, uh, you'll have interdisciplinary rounds. So you'll have the nurse, the medical student, the resident, the intern, if you have those, if you are at a teaching facility, otherwise, if you're at a non-teaching facility, you'll be in charge of doing it, uh, you know, doing those things yourself. Um, but yeah, you'll have the nurse, you'll have the nutritionist, you'll hopefully have the pharmacist and you'll walk patient to patient and you'll discuss head to toe all of their problems um, and systematically address every issue that, that comes up for the patient. Um, and then you'll reassess the patients after rounds. You'll, you'll perform any procedures that are required, uh, call consultants and transfer patients out of the ICU, document what you did, await new consultations and transfers and sign out at 1900. And it never, ever works out like this. Uh, not that <laughs> sign out thing necessarily, but, uh, but you know, this is the, this is the framework, but the ICU is so fluid because you can get an ER consult. You can get a code blue that you have to run during the middle of rounds to the floor and take care of somebody. Somebody may urgently need a procedure that you can't say, Oh, we're just going to wait until after rounds. There's just, there's so much chaos and heterogeneity to it. And it's, it's beautiful. Um, <laughs> if you it's, like it's, that. So it's, it, yeah, I love that you added that context, right? It's beautiful for you. And I'm sure maybe 50% of the people watching this would go, <laughs> oh my gosh, <laughs> I would want to die. That's too hectic for me. Yeah. I want to just show up and every 30 minutes, go see my next patient and whatever. Right. Yep. Exactly. Exactly. So that brings us into the pulmonary clinic. Uh, which is arrive typically it's like a three three days a week or so that you'll that you'll see patients in the clinic probably get in around seven or so you'll review your charts before you see your patients and then you'll see a patient every 15 to 45 minutes depending on if they're a patient you know well or if they're a new consult or whatnot you grab some lunch then you'll get some more patients and they're scheduled you know back to back to back um, and then oftentimes you'll you'll set a a couple inpatient procedure, excuse me, in clinic procedures. Um, and then you'll complete documentation, look over maybe if there's some PFTs or anything like that to read pulmonary function tests, um, cause you're in charge of reading those as well. And just deal with kind of the day-to-day -day issues that, that occur in a, in a pulmonary clinic, which would be patients calling about refills for medications, patients not feeling very good, all those types of things. You just kind of solve all, you're generally solving all those problems throughout your day. Which to me, uh, I love pulmonary, but it's it's actually a little bit more chaotic because if you have this set time where you've got, okay, I've got 30 minutes to see a patient. Now I've got to see my next patient, but maybe I wanted to talk to that patient. As you can tell, I like talking. <laughs> uh, maybe I want to talk to that patient a little bit longer and get a little bit more history from them. But now your next patient's waiting. And then you know, your nurse is asking you, hey, you know, doc, we, we got to get like this prescription for prednisone for this guy who's not feeling good. So there's pluses and minuses. Uh, I'm more critical care heavy. So, um, you know, that's that's my mindset, but it, it's got pluses and minuses on both sides. Um, yeah. And then a lot of times you'll have a couple procedure days, right? So you'll have like your bronchoscopy and your thoracentesis are kind of the the big procedures that we do, particularly bronchoscopy. I know that you had a, a really great talk from an interventional pulmonologist a, a while back um, that, that really delved into the bronchoscopy. So I don't go into it too, too much, 
Um, but we have the ability to kind of do some procedures, which is fun. Uh, so like, here's the, the kind of emotional reasons that, that grab you, that you're like, ah, I want to do ICU. Like, and this is what you get. This is why you go on thinking you want to be a psychiatrist, uh, wanting to be an orthopedist, and then eventually finding what you want to do. Cause you, you get those, those gut feelings and you work with somebody that you really like. Um, so it's super fun, right? You get to, you get to really stretch your mind in, in cool, exciting, stressful ways. Um, you get the ability to do bedside procedures. Um, and, and so you get to do procedures, but you don't have to like spend all day in the OR. Um, and then you get to, you're, you're, you're the, you're the captain, you're in charge of everyone. So you're, you're managing, you know, your team, you're managing the nursing team from afar <laughs> and, uh, and, and you're kind of, you're just in charge of everyone. You're, you're dealing with the patients directly. You're dealing with their families. It's awesome. Uh, you're like, you're the doctor that people come to when they're like, okay, something bad is happening. This patient is literally dying. I, like when I was thinking about doing this, I, I'm so nervous to do this lecture today. Honestly, I, I'm, I'm not sure exactly why I'm so nervous, but, uh, but it's funny when I was thinking about, I'm like, I would much rather run into a code blue with an absolutely crashing dying <laughs> patient right now than, than turn on my camera and start talking about this, you it's know, so funny yeah. about this lecture. So it's like having that kind of in your back pocket is, is really fun. You get to wear scrubs all the time, which is very enjoyable. <laughs> and, uh, and then you get are, some, are, are you team figs? I am. Yeah, I am. <laughs> I got my little, yeah, there they are. Oh, there they are. Yeah. <laughs> um, so logical reasons, however, uh, so it's got a nice block schedule, right? You'll do like seven days on or 14 days on or whatever, you know, maybe three days on four days off, whatever you want to do with your, with your crew. Um, the pay is, is at least currently it's fantastic. And it's like usually done just to, you get this much money for this many hours of work. So it's, you don't have to really worry about like your billing and stuff like that. It's, yeah. it's billing is quite simple in the ICU. Um, every patient that you see is actually sick, right? So like, that was one of the things that really frustrated me when I went into thinking I want to do emergency medicine. There's no gate to the yeah. emergency department. So patients come in like, ah, I'm dying. And they're, they're not actually dying. Whereas, <laughs> you know, you have this like barrier, like, okay, now I'm going to be in the ICU. So, uh, like you have to get through the emergency room to get to the ICU. So there's kind of this barrier and you actually see patients like this is what yeah. I thought I was going to be doing when I went in medical school is, Oh yeah. Every single patient I'm going to see is really sick and has all these problems, you know? Um, uh, and then you, you get, you do have a, a fair amount of time because you have a lower census than like a general medical ward um, to really focus on your patients and kind of delve into like their specific problems, which is cool. Um, yeah. It's interesting. I've never thought of the ICU having gatekeepers like that, but it's, it's true. <laughs> like there, there is a general standard of acuity for being in the ICU. Yeah. It's interesting. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, it's like, yeah. You, and, and, I have the ability if I want to, to be like, that patient doesn't need to come to the ICU in my opinion. You know what I mean? <laughs> not that I do that very often. I'm very, I don't like to block a ton of patients or whatever, but it's always it's the nice. ortho patients, isn't it? <laughs> it's, it is. You knew it. <laughs> um, and then uh, you, so I, I personally, I love medicines. I love their ability to impact patients health. I don't like starting a medicine for the rest of somebody's life. Yeah. Um, and I like the ability to turn on a, literally give somebody liquid adrenaline, um, to keep their heart going. And then when I'm done with it, turn it off quickly. Cause it's, you know, it has its, its problems. So, um, I like the ability, like when you're, when you're in the ICU, you can say, I need this, I need it stat. I need this, you know, chemotherapy drug, whatever, uh, to, to fix this patient's, you know, problem, bam, and then you get it. So it's, it's just nice lot logistically. So here's some of the procedures that we do. This is me putting a endotracheal tube in on a COVID patient a uh, couple years back. It's before uh, the boxes for it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, this is me doing a paracentesis. I haven't done one of those in several years. This I was right out of fellowship when I took this picture. Um, this is a bronchoscopy. It's somebody's inflamed airway. And then there's a picture of me doing the bronchoscopy from the side. 
Um, and then here's the thoracentesis. All these pictures are obtained with patient's consent, mm. by the way, too. Uh, yes, yeah, <laughs> delicious. That was a, an Amber Bach. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, you know, just being able to do these fun bedside procedures is awesome. Yeah. Um, some cons about it. Uh, one of the big things that, that really got me was you suddenly are in charge of dealing with a lot of people's lung nodules. Like they, these lung nodule results come to you and then you need to disposition and say, okay, this is a six millimeter lung nodule that needs follow-up in six months or whatever. This is a four millimeter nodule. It doesn't need. Um, so when you have all these different nodules sitting, like as soon as I got all them kind of like sitting on my shoulders, it's a lot of stress just sitting in the background. Like, Oh, if I miss one of these, if I forget one of these, if I like lose my little sticky note and this patient doesn't follow up. And then in five years, that little nodule turns into a, like a super cancer. It, it's going to be, it's going to feel like it's on me. You know what I mean? So that's hard. That's hard dealing yeah. with it. Um, so I just bring that up. Outpatient life can be kind of tough and kind of exhausting, um, in its own ways. And, and when you have this, uh, when you have these kind of set drive schedules that you have patients, okay, you're booked out six months or whatever. You can't just be like, oh, okay, cool, sweet. We're going to Hawaii, like, you know, pop over, do whatever you want and, and kind of take a spontaneous vacation like that. So yeah. those are some can, of the, like- Can the, I the, ask, you, you talk about the, the, the potential stress of, of the lung nodules and the constant what ifs. Um, yes, you're you're also dealing with the ICU and the stress of patients being really critically ill and passing. Um, how do you deal with that? How do you leave it at work if you can? Or when you come home, how do you how do you wake up the next day excited to go go to work? Because I think that worries a lot of students going through the process. I think we're I think in a better society now where we talk about this more and not just like put on a brave face and show up every day, we, we can talk about how we, how we handle this self-care. Yeah, no, I, I, um, I really appreciate you bringing that up and it is hard. I mean, I, I, I'm an emotional guy. I will, I will not uncommonly when there's a, a tough outcome, I'll start crying with the families and stuff like that. That's just, that's just me. So like, um, yeah. I kind of wear it on my sleeve a little bit more than a lot of my colleagues, but a big part, you know, a big factor for me is I have a really supportive family. I've got a really supportive wife. I, I got a great dog. So I come home <laughs> and, you know, I, I try to kind of box those things up as much as I can, but I also, you know, am able to share that with her. And I talk constantly. Is she in medicine or no? No, she's a, she's a physical therapist, uh, excuse me, not a physical therapist. She's a personal trainer. Sorry. Okay. Uh, so she's in, she's in the other side of medicine, preventative <laughs> yeah. you know, side. Um, but, you know, I, I, uh, I talk with my friends who are in medicine, you know, my colleagues constantly. And I, I, I do think about, well, what about that case? What about this? What about that? How could I have done this better? And I bring it up to them and, you know, and they share it with me and we all kind of just support each other. Like I have multiple group chats with my colleagues where it's like, Hey, what about this? What, you know, what do you think? What would you do, et cetera. And, um, and that's huge having that support system. And then, at the end of the day, I, I make mistakes. I'm not perfect. I know that. I'm not even like, you know, I, I would say I'm a good doctor. I would say I'm a, I wouldn't say I'm like an amazing, great doctor or anything like that. I try my absolute best. Um, but I look at myself in the mirror and, you know, every morning I'm like, I, I did my best. I did everything that I possibly could to, to like take care of that patient. And if there was a problem, um, you know, it's not solely on me. It's on, mm -hmm. you know, patients are sick. And that's one of the, actually, it's one of the nice things about the ICU. Patients are so sick that like you can make them better. And if you don't make them better in a way, there's like almost not an expectation to, you know what I mean? Like I've heard I, that I was, before from, from other critical care docs is that it lessens the pressure a little bit Yeah, because the expectation is they're probably going to die. Yeah. Uh, and so uh, the ones that you save, it's yay. And the ones that you <laughs> lost, it's really like they were going to die anyway. Yeah. Exactly. As crass as that sounds, but that potentially helps. It's true. Yeah. That and I, I do share a, a fair amount of dark humor, you know, <laughs> about it too. So yep. just whatever, you know, whatever kind of gets you through it.
So about critical care, some of the cons, you can have a census of literally zero patients for like days. Um, and then your, your census can explode to having over 20 patients. So you just, you never know what you're going to walk into. You might be like, it might be super chill and super lazy, or you might be like ready to go to war. Basically, um, the hours can be super hard in fellowship. I did one month of rotations. We would do just 36 hour shifts <laughs> where literally like you're on call in the hospital and I think on one of my shifts, I literally slept for like one hour. Uh, mm. So I just, I don't support that. I don't think that's a good way to make decisions. I think you're like operating on like eight brain cells at that point, but, <laughs> but, uh, but you can kind of do anything for, you can do anything for a little while, I guess. Um, and then it's hard, you know, you, you deal with the, the patients and their families and you're like, like you said, you know, you're giving bad news a lot. Uh, yeah. But one of the cool things, I mean, every con can be a pro and every poke can be a con in a way. So like one of the one of the cool things about it is that you do have this opportunity to really share this experience with somebody at the, you know, the worst part in their entire life. So it's like you can you can really help them and guide them through that and help them to make, you know, the decision that they and their family member wanted. And so I think that being able to translate this uber complex medical stuff into uh into terms that that are understandable and agreeable to a regular you know not medically educated individual is is really it's cool i i find it to be super fascinating um i'll go through this really quick and i'll start going quicker because i realize i'm kind of I'm, I'm i'm talking very slowly <laughs> so uh this is my this is my greatest case ever so i got the opportunity when covid hit to be told on Friday, hey, you're going to Guam because we the person who was with the unit that was supposed to go there is actually an uh, internal medicine doctor, not an intensivist. So you're going to be on the plane on uh, on Monday morning. Um, and so I got I went to a completely overwhelmed ICU, a civilian ICU, um, and got to take care of a ton of patients with horrible COVID. Back when back in the days when COVID was like killing everyone who went on the ventilator essentially and uh and this this young gal um she was 33 months pregnant she was mm -hmm. extremely unwell um from her covid she had hypoxic respiratory failure that progressed and i fortunately had you know one of my colleagues who was down there um who i literally met two days beforehand was helping me coordinate with their anesthesiologist to uh, get this patient intubated um, because honestly, those are the types of patients that you need to like, at least for me, just drop your ego and just let the, the person who deals with airways all the time do. Um, got them intubated, got uh, the baby delivered and, um, and then she was stuck on the ventilator and she was stuck on the ventilator and stuck on the ventilator. And we started you know, wondering why is she stuck on the ventilator? And it was because her right heart basically collapsed um, due to so much stress of having the baby, having COVID, having prolonged hypoxic respiratory failure, low oxygen levels caused so much stress on her heart that um, that she was not able to, you know, get good oxygen levels. And so she was stuck on the ventilator with COVID which as I mentioned was like at that time it was very high mortality rate and with a brand new baby. Um, and so we fought super hard every day and we adjusted her medications around. And, you know, I, I went in every day and tried to talk to her about taking out, you know, the breathing tube and seeing if we could do it. And we would do little trials where we turn off the ventilator and just give a little bit of support. And every time like her, God, her eyes were like the biggest, like they were dinner saucers, how scared she was to get that breathing tube out. And then finally, when we got it out and got her onto the regular, you know, high flow nasal cannula, which was still a ton of oxygen. Um, she was just so happy. She immediately started crying. And like, I started, uh, I started crying. I might start crying right now. Who knows? <laughs> and, uh, and it was just, it was, it was like, it was just awesome. Um, so yeah. we were able to get her off the ventilator. And eventually, after I left the island, uh, we got her down to regular like nasal cannula and then off of oxygen. And 
this is her little baby boy who was born healthy. And uh, wow. so it's just beautiful, absolutely beautiful. And then after, after I left the island, the hospitalist, Dr. Rumini, um, she continued to take care of this patient when she was up in the hospital, you know, she was still on a couple of, of liters of oxygen. And, uh, and this patient said, damn it, I'm gonna, I'm gonna cry. So the patient said, what should I, what should I name my child? And Dr. Romini said, oh, you should name him Michael after that doctor. So I was like, and she did. <laughs> so there's a little awesome. baby <laughs> on the island of Guam who has, you know, my first name and uh, he's about, you know, three years old now. So that's anyways, awesome. I, I, that's like my, my, my happiest moment. Probably it'll ever be my happiest moment, but that's, a, I mean, it's just, it's, it's awesome. So switching gears a little bit, um, military medicine. Uh, so you can do HPSP. You can go directly through the military medical school. Um, from what I understand, basically, at least when I was in, if you got into medical school, you would most likely get the scholarship. There's a high chance of getting the scholarship. They pay for all of your- For the army. For the army. The air force the is army. very selective. Okay, actually, that's a very good point. <laughs> so I tried to join the air force because I always wanted to join the air force because my dad was in the air force. And- uh, by the time I even applied, they're like, we've already given away our scholarships. <laughs> yeah. Um, yep. So then they're like, you should check the army, dude. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so anyways, I'm super happy. I got, I got awesome training. Um, some good pros you get taken care of. Like, like I said, my brother, his, you know, his brain tumor excision, all that stuff. He got flown down to a specialist hospital in, in um, Texas that was, I think it was, uh, Houston or Dallas, some, some like really nice center got incredible yeah. care. Everything was paid for. Yeah. And, uh, I, I will just, never understand a military member being against a single payer system. I'm like, yeah. you benefited from that system. <laughs> <laughs> Your family true. benefited from that system. <laughs> anyway. That's, so some of the drawbacks, uh, you don't get to choose exactly where you want to go. You don't necessarily even get to choose what specialty you want to do. You, you yeah. know, like there's like me. <laughs> uh, exactly. Yeah. Uh, I've got colleagues who we graduated. I graduated from residency. And one of the reasons I went into pulmonary critical care, in all honesty, was I wanted to make sure I was attached to a bigger institution because um, I had friends who went out of residency and got sent, you know, immediately from finishing their medical training, excuse me, their internal medicine training where they have this, you know, subspet specialized knowledge in dealing with hospitalized patients and advanced patients uh, to having to go run a clinic for like three years in Fort Polk and like the middle of nowhere in Alabama. And, yeah. you know, it's, it, it, it can be, I, I got extremely lucky and I'm, I'm a huge proponent and fan of, uh, of at least considering the military, but you know, you do, you do lose that autonomy. Um, yep. Your pay comparatively is not as good when you're a, an attending. It's comparatively way better when you're a resident though, which is nice. And since you don't have any, like, you don't have any loans uh, from medical school, you, you have like quite a bit of earning potential, which is really nice. Uh, I got awesome training. So I trained at Walter Reed. That's where the president gets his healthcare and has for years and years um, across the street. I got to train at the NIH, got to go to Georgetown and train there for a couple months, work at Hopkins a couple months, like, you know, shock traumas, legendary hospital in Baltimore where all the, you know, shot up super, that's what you're saying. They call it C stars. Is that, do they call it the yeah. same thing for you? Yeah. yeah. And they, uh, so yeah, they, that, that was a rotation where I had to work 36 hours at a time. And I, yeah. I developed this like, bald, not bald. Like I developed this white patch on my beard. That's still here today. That's like <laughs> it happened during that. Cause I think it was that stressful. Wow. So Here's my stuff. Not, not that exciting. Here's me when I first started, like kind of, you know, wide eyed and bushy tailed. There's me in the middle, like, Oh my gosh, is this ever going to end? And there's me kind of like toward, towards the end where I'm like, <laughs> all right, this is cool. I'm enjoying life again, much more like lackadaisical. Uh, and then the future. So once I'm going to get out of the army, and I'm actually going to join the Air National Guard um, yeah. so that I can do uh, CCAT, which is CCAT the, stuff. That's awesome. Is, I'm super excited about it. It's like a floating ICU. You get yeah. patients all the way from anywhere in the world to, you know, our, our main hub hospitals at Walter Reed or 
uh, or Brook Army Medical Center in like 24 to 48 hours. It's just, it's incredible to have an ICU. Yeah. Um, some financial benefits. At the time, my school was one of the most expensive. It was 55K. I just looked it up today. It's $90,000 a year to go to medical school. Stupid. It's just absurd. Yeah. I, I, it's absurd. Um, so that would all be, or at least should all be paid for. Um, telemedicine, there's so much out there. There's so many cool things that are like we have on our disposal. I have, uh, I have, me and a few friends have kind of set up a beta test group for doing a, uh, a telemedicine program. And we have, if we want, we all have full-time jobs after we get out of the military with that, with that kind of test where we literally round in a different uh, time zone and can take care of patients real time, do all of our, all of our rounding, all of our records we can get, you know, instantly. It's, it's just amazing. It's so cool. There's uh, like one of my colleagues, he's, he's working on this project through the, I believe it's through the military where operators in the field, like an EMT or, or like a Marine or whatever has goggles on and on those goggles, they can see what he's drawing. And so like they can look at something and then he'll draw, okay, grab this item. He'll draw an arrow to it. Or he'll say, you know, poke here with that needle or whatever, and they'll know what to do. It's That's just awesome. it's crazy. That's so much. Uh, and one of, so one of my coolest things I did was I was flying across country and I was using my Wi-Fi on board the flight. And I saw an x-ray for a patient that was also like 12 hours across the world in the other direction that I was able to interpret and make decisions on like simultaneously. So these are the rounding devices, similar type stuff, uh, you know. Um, okay, a couple of things, things I wish I knew uh, I was in your shoes. There's so many different ways to go about getting into medical school. And if you don't get in the first time, like don't, that's not the end of the world. Um, there's so many like post back programs, you can retry, you can consider all different options. So don't, don't oh, yeah. like, let it beat you up, you know? Um, and then remember to take care of yourself. This is not a race. If you're planning on doing it, you're planning on doing it for life. Um, so, you know, just enjoy your life and, and take that vacation. If you, if you have it, you know, don't, don't delay gratification, but don't delay gratification to the point of absurdity. Um, yeah. So if you possibly can start investing some kind of money. So I just did a quick graphical analysis here. Uh, if you started at 20 years old and put $100 in the S&P 500, which the ticker is VOO, is the Vanguard index fund, it's the same. So $100 a month in the S&P 500 at its annual rate, which is absurdly high. I don't know how it's this high, but its average annual rate is 11.88% which clearly these like this year, it's not been, <laughs> it probably won't be for a couple of years, but that actually means right now, if you put money in, you're basically buying on a discount, but I can talk way more about that some other time, but, um, but you can, you, you'll in 45 years of just putting a hundred dollars a month away. If you do it consistently every single month, you'll have 1.5, $1.6 million in the bank. And depending on the variability, you can have, you know, either as low as only, Shucks, only three hundred and thirty thousand dollars. Darn it! Or you could have as high as seven point nine, you know, million dollars based on if that I, I added a five percent variability to it. Um, yeah. Are are you a are you a Dr. James um, Dolly? Is that it? I forget yeah. how you say his name. Yeah, uh, I White do. Coat I do guy. love his. Uh, <laughs> I love his. He gets really into the weeds. I, I'm kind of yeah. like I like the <laughs> the the primary stuff and, yep. but uh, but. But yeah, I'm I'm like blown away by all the yeah. yeah he's the, he's a friend. He's a, he's a fellow uh, military guy as well. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So here here's a, a quick graph of if you start later, if you started at age um, age forty by the age sixty five, if you put away one thousand dollars a month at age forty, you'd be looking at the same or even a little bit less money. So just start early with a little amount, and then. You know, I know a hundred dollars a month might be a lot right now, but you, you might be able to do it, you know, or even yep. whatever you can do five, 10, $50, just get into the habit of paying yourself first because yep. that compound interest is outrageous. I mean, look at that graph. Um, yeah. 
Yeah, so, there, there's a uh, there's a tool. I'll, I'll mention it real quick. I really like it. It's called Digit, digit.co. You, it's a, an app, you connect it to your bank account and you can set up a rainy day fund or you can set up, a, I'm applying to med school fund and it uses some some models and it, it knows when money typically comes out of your account and when money goes into your account and it'll draw out automatically, just, just hands off like 50 cents one day, $1.50 the next day um, to try to get you to your goal. It's really cool. So it's like, you don't even feel it. Like you yeah. it just, it's like, oh, yep. Yeah, that's really You don't smart. miss it. That's so cool. Whereas you might've spent that on like whatever, a soda or something. And then <laughs> you, you just didn't notice that it's there. And then, yeah. you know, that's, that's awesome. Um, so a couple just quick tips to, to success um, for young doctors and medical students, pre-medical alike. Um, I always say like, especially with our, our newest generation, some of the old timey docs don't like when you say, oh, hey, what's up, man, or what, like, if you just start off and say, hey, I, I'm, you know, I'm so-and-so, Dr. So-and-so, thank you, nice to meet you, and then oftentimes they'll say, oh, yeah, I'm Michael, just call me Michael, don't worry about it, you know, like, but it's always good to start more formal and then kind of work your way down. If you are going to see a patient and present it to a, a doctor uh, attending, um, just sneak away for like five minutes and read about whatever that disease is, and it will give you so much confidence, and they will pick up on that, and you will just, it will make your presentation so much smoother. If you, like the difference between a trained and untrained medical student or early physician is so vast, and it takes almost no time to just quickly learn a couple of things about the disease and say, oh yeah, usually we'd use a, you know, lisinopril for this or whatever, and they're like, wow, good good for you. You knew that. That's, that's incredible. You know, like I wouldn't have known that at your level or whatnot. So um, you're never going to learn it all. Just like Dr. Gray was telling you, you know, it, it changes every two months now, or it doubles every two months. So the things that you need to know, you will learn over and over and over. Cause you'll see them over and over and over. I've learned so many bacteria in my life. I can't <laughs> even tell you. And the other I ones I really see are staph pseudomonas and E. coli. Uh, I, not really, but I don't know if you had the thought. I had a thought when I first started my, I don't know if I was a med student or a, an intern at this point. I was like, how do they know when they're writing prescriptions? Like what order everything goes in and the fact that it's a hundred milligrams of cholase, like how do they know that? <laughs> I'm like, Oh, it's cause they do it 4 million times a day. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. That's it's like, it just, it literally becomes second nature. And you don't <laughs> even necessarily have to practice it. It just, it's like, it, it just, what you need is there. It's yep. so, it's, it's awesome. A couple other things. Uh, 17 might be an exaggeration, but it takes hearing something, I think at least 12 times and thinking about it for it to actually stick in your head. So don't be upset if you are learning that brachial plexus or whatever, and <laughs> it doesn't, it doesn't like want to stay there. Just keep doing it over and over. I had to do acid base. I'm embarrassed how many times I had to like redo acid base over and over and over <laughs> before I finally understood it um, and, and, and could do it like in my own head. Um, so <laughs> this is a little bit, this is a little bit uh, conspiring is the wrong word, but uh, if you're, if you tell your preceptor who you're working with, cause you're going to have all these different rotations, right? If you tell your preceptor that you are potentially interested in going into that field, they're going to teach you better. I, like, I hate to say it, but they will. And you may potentially do that field. Even if you think you're going to be a surgeon, you may actually end up becoming an endocrinologist. Even if you think you're going to be a psychiatrist, you might become a neurosurgeon. Like, so telling that physician, hey, I am interested in it and I may do this, you know, one day they're going to give you, I hate to say it, but they probably will focus more on your education. And this is huge. You are at this level, you're already a professional. Okay. So if somebody tells you otherwise, says that, oh, you're just like a medical student or you're just pre-medical or gives you some kind of crap, um, you you have the power to tell them I'm a professional and I deserve to be treated like one um, all throughout your career, from patients, from other physicians, from your colleagues shoot, even for your family. It's like, you know, like you, you have that. <laughs> so here's a couple books. If you're interested in reading a couple things, um, that I found to be very helpful. Um, 
med school confidential is really good. You can read it before you get into medical dude, school. And- dude, why why are none of my books up there? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's a major fashion faux pas. Like this one's really good, and this <laughs> one's really good. Oh, you're canceled. Goodness. All right, enough. All right, you're kicking you off. You like that? Turn it off. Well, in in fairness, Doctor Gray, those those books were not out when I was a pre medical student and, right. and a medical that's, student. That's all right. That's all right. Uh, those are all wonderful books. Um, I agree. Uh, and if you are going to watch shows, the two shows that actually represent medicine in my opinion are uh are scrubs and believe it or not like house is really dramatized and silly but it's kind of a fun way to learn medicine even though it's don't usually... break into people's houses please <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah um so the future for me uh i like like i mentioned so i'm going to do the air national guard so i can complete my military retirement and uh where maybe, what state uh nevada reno nevada uh my buddy's okay. down there he said the commander's really cool so <laughs> yeah i don't know i i have a buddy in the guard i don't know if he's in nevada or not he's an em doc in nevada um, oh really yeah um he's a he's a flight doc um nice i will guard i will almost assuredly meet him and probably pretty <laughs> soon that's yeah. cool um and so, you know, like I said, I, I've been extremely lucky with the military. I've got great training. And now because of that, I have no debt. I have a career that, you know, uh, allows me to accumulate excess funds. And I don't spend a lot of money aside for buying figs. Uh, so <laughs> at the end of the day, like I could, you know, realistically, I could probably retire right now if I wanted to. And that's not a brag. It's me telling you. I, I, if you're interested in trying to do something similar as me, I, I, you know, reach out to me, talk to me. I am more than happy to share kind of my advice and opinion. As you can tell, I love talking. (laughs) So I'm more than happy. So just, uh, all right, there's that. And that's, that leads into my second plug. Please follow my, my itty bitty uh, Instagram and, and help me share kind of my experience and, and, you know, help other people to get to where they need to be as well. So, uh, last thoughts. Uh, somebody told me this at, during. He was actually like a dentist, and he he gave this at the end of his lecture in my medical school, and it really stuck with me. If you shoot for the moon uh, and miss, then the worst thing that'll happen is that you land on a cloud. So, you know, aim for the stars. Keep trying. If something doesn't work the first time, it doesn't mean it was wrong. It just means that maybe it wasn't the right time. Or just keep trying. You're, you're going to succeed. I really wish you guys the best in the world. And, uh, and yeah, thank you awesome. so much for this opportunity and this time. Thank you, Dr. Gray. Dr. Michael Schweitzer. <laughs> and it's pronounced EBITDA. I finally got your, <laughs> your version out of my head and I finally remembered it. All right. Um, thank you for hanging out. We had a, about 120 people here hanging out, learning from you. So Hopefully you get some future poem critical care military docs in the house. <laughs> Everyone have a wonderful day. I'll see you next week. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye.